Welcome to the first episode of Cinema Creep, a Black Mass Films podcast where we dissect all things vile, disgusting, and downright terrifying in the world of horror cinema. So I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Everblack Coffee. So if you want some amazing, fresh coffee with a macabre twist, check out everblackcoffee.com. They have the... Uh, the light roast, which is called Coffin Shaker, and the dark roast is Black Magic. So go to everblack.com and grab a bag for yourself today. So we're going to jump straight into this. So we're trying to keep this uh, limited at about 25 minutes. Um, basically, we have a studio setup that we want to do this in, but given worldwide circumstances, you know, we can't do that. So uh, uh, this is how we've got it, and this is how it's going to be until uh, we can get it going the way we want, right? So... I'm Justin James. I'm one of the founding members of Black Mass Films. I'm a cinematographer, a screenwriter, and a director. This is my co-host. What's up, guys? My name is Andrew Henderson. I am the other founding member of Black Mass Films. Um, I am also a writer and most importantly, I guess, or for the most part, a cinematographer. And uh, apparently I'm turned podcaster <clears throat> now. So uh, how you doing, Justin? Uh, I am... Doing the best I can for this lockdown thing, which is actually what we're going to talk about today. So, um, you know, Andrew and I have day jobs. We are essential workers. Um, well, some people think we are. Uh, so we have to go to work. So I haven't had too much time to watch a whole lot of films, but the films that we have gotten to watch, that's what we're going to talk about, is uh, lockdown uh, films. So, uh, yes, yeah, so we definitely revisited some classics here. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh and I see in the show notes you've got some stuff I haven't checked out yet, so I'm pretty stoked to hear you talk about that, and I've got to add them to my list too. So we're just going to jump straight into it for uh, time's sake. So the first film I watched, um, if you don't know, I am a major John Carpenter fan. The whole reason I got into filmmaking. Uh, so uh, The Fog, 1980. Uh, it's a classic written by John Carpenter and Deborah Hill, directed by John Carpenter. This stars... Uh, you know, quite uh, a few big hitters in the John Carpenter world of casting. Yep. Jamie Lee Curtis, Adrian Barbeau, Tom Atkins, Charles Cyphers, Janet Lee. Uh, so, you know, Janet Lee alone, just from Psycho and Jamie Lee Curtis, which is actually Jamie uh, Janet Lee's daughter, uh, most notably from Halloween. Um, and then the rest of the cast, you know, pops in and out of uh, John Carpenter films quite frequently. But the synopsis of this film, if you haven't seen it, uh, an unearthly fog rolls into a coastal town exactly 100 years after a ship mysteriously sank in its waters. So basically, the ship sinks, this fog comes in, and uh, there's a shipwreck. So 100 years later, this fog reoccurs, and with it comes the uh, vengeful spirits of these uh, pirates, if you will, as Andrew calls them, motherfucking ghost pirates. But you, oh, yeah. I, don't, oh, yeah. I don't give it the appeal you do. Let, let me hear it, let me hear it motherfucking ghost pirates see right there it is but so yeah what more can you ask for i mean there's creepy fog that rolls in uh adrian barbeau uh she plays a smooth talking jazz radio show host that she broadcasts from a uh a lighthouse and she sees this fog coming in and she tries to warn the town and every time this fog rolls in that's when the uh the undead crew walks in with their cutlasses and sabers and their hook hands and they're just basically seeking vengeance i mean it's slashing. it's straight up uh slashing and uh dashing you know um it, it's 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 a fun film i mean uh it, it's a classic in my opinion had a budget of a million dollars uh to give you some insight on that or give you a comparison halloween had i believe a three hundred thousand dollar budget and even a million dollars even in 1980 was not a lot of money to make a film um but I want to touch a little bit before I pass this over to Andrew for his first pick. Uh, John Carpenter is a master at building worlds and uh, making you believe that these characters really exist in this world. So, um, you know, Haddonfield, Illinois is not a real place in the original Halloween. That was Pasadena, California that that was filmed at. Um, this is also supposed to be Antonio Bay, which is, uh, you know, a fictional um, Bay City. But this was actually filmed in California as well. So you want to touch on that a little bit? Oh yeah. So uh, so one of the <laughs> oh yeah. So one of the things that uh, yeah that uh, John Carpenter's great at, you know, is he's he's a master at building these worlds, right? So when a filmmaker can build these worlds and and make them believable, right? So 
when they create these characters, these over-the-top killers and stuff, and they actually make it seem like these characters could really exist in these worlds. So, like, he made it to where you believed Michael Myers could actually really be in Haddonfield, right? He made it to where you believe there could be ghost pirates in Antonio Bay. So when these masters of horror create these um, these perfect environments or these perfect worlds, it really pulls you into the story. And I've seen this go the other way where some filmmakers kind of lack this uh, this ability to do this. And it kind of, you know, is like, why don't the cops just show up or you know why don't they uh why don't they just call the military in or something like that right but you know you know that in a John Carpenter movie there's a good reason why the cops aren't showing up or the cops do show up and they just can't do anything because it's all written so well right well i mean in every halloween film even the ones that down the road john carpenter didn't really have anything to do with like that's part of the the world building is the characters um what are the cops going to do to michael myers you know they in every film, they show up and they try, and there's nothing they can do. And then, I mean, in the fog, like, you can't kill these things. They're already dead, and, uh, you know, they show up unexpected, and then they kill you before you can even try anything. So, uh, yeah, definitely check out The Fog, uh, a classic from 1980. Um, got some uh, some good casting, and uh, it's an all-around fun film to watch. It's also, we've discussed this real quick, uh, you know, it's a... An easy transition for someone trying to get into horror. It is rated R, but there's no real, like, there's no lewdness, no uh, over-the-top language or gore. Um, there are some up-close shots of uh, some of the deaths, but, I mean, it's nothing too out there. So, uh, check it out. And uh, what have you, uh, you, you watched any movies or, well, yeah, you got this one here. What is it? Yeah, yeah. so, uh, so guys, I've watched this, this movie that uh, caught my eye actually today. And uh, it's on Amazon Prime, so every once in a while, I'll just peruse and see what's new and what's out there. I mean, like we all do, but, um, you know, I like to watch a lot of B-movies, a lot of second-rate horror. So a lot of times, I turn to Amazon Prime for those. Um, and this one is called Mom, um, but it's not like Mother or any of those other movies like that. It's not with a strange little possessed child. This one is M period O period M which stands for Mothers of Monsters, and this was released this year. This was written and directed by a writer-director named Tusia, I believe is how you say it, Lyman. And uh, she's done a lot of work in, like, daytime television and stuff like that. So she definitely has some accolades to her name, definitely experienced, but I think this is her first foray into um, horror filmmaking or at least feature-length horror filmmaking. And um, there's some stars in this. A lot of them come from the TV world, but most notably the one that I guess most people are going to recognize or resonate with will be um, Edward Asner. He has a ton of credits to his name. I believe over 320 credits to his name on IMDb. So this guy's been in everything, right? But um, one major thing that you guys may know or your children may know is he played the old man's voice in Up!, and he also played Santa Claus's voice in the Elf movie with Will Ferrell. So that's uh, that's pretty awesome. So unfortunately, he only has a secondary role in this movie. He plays a therapist, and he's only in and out of the movie for a few minutes at a time. But um, definitely uh, props to Edward Asner, still going at it, right? Like, the guy, is, he's, he's up there in age, but he's still killing it. And now he's, he's in this horror thing. So, I mean, props to him. So uh, real quick, the synopsis on this is a distraught mother suspects her teenage son is a psychopath who may shoot up his high school, but when he outsmarts the mental health care system, she is forced to take matters into her own hands, a mother's worst nightmare. So the synopsis is kind of vague. I don't really like it. I think it could be written better um, because the movie is better than the synopsis. And um, it's not more or less like the kid is planning on shooting up his school like um the movie elephant by gus van zant from the early 2000s this is more or less like he's just sort of um he's sort of like a uh sort of like a sociopath a little bit like it shows him growing up and it shows him killing some animals and shit like that so you don't really know where it's gonna lead but it never really plays too much on like he's gonna shoot up his school um i think they may mention it like his mom says at one time 
I'm scared he might shoot up his school, but it's not like a serious plot line or anything. But the coolest thing about this movie is that um, how they break the fourth wall, which means that the actors and actresses actually talk to the camera. So the mom in most of the film is talking directly to her cell phone because she's creating these video logs of herself, um, essentially documenting the fucked up shit that her son is doing, right? So she has uh, documentation of it to essentially have proof that he's a psychopath. So she ends up installing all these nanny cams and all these hidden cameras around her house um, in order to capture him in the act of doing all these weird things that he's doing. But as the film goes on, I'm not going to spoil it, but as the film goes on, you start understanding that the mom is kind of crazy herself. And then the son starts uh, recording her and capturing her doing these weird things. So it's sort of like a head to head um, who's going to prove who is the crazy one first by the end of the film. And uh, like I said, it's a good rainy day film. It rained all day today. So uh, I wouldn't put it at the very tip top of your list, but I would definitely put it in the top 10 for you to watch um, if you've got some of those major other films out of the way that you want to watch. So Mothers of Monsters, give it a look. Tosia Lyman or Tosia Lyman. Um, be looking for your future work. Yeah, I'm going so to check what, that out. Yeah, no, my bad. What you got for the... What <laughs> no, you got you're for good. Your, uh, uh, for your second um, pick there, well, uh, you know I've I've watched a couple films, but we we each just picked two of our individual uh, watches. So I I stayed you know with the John Carpenter. I went with Escape from New York. It's a 1981 classic, uh, written by John Carpenter and Nick Castle, which we're gonna touch on that a little bit. Uh, it's directed by John Carpenter. Now this one has uh, some heavy hitting talent. It stars Kurt Russell. He's the uh, the front man of this film. Donald Pleasance, you know, most notably as uh, you know, he's in several uh, Carpenter films. Obviously, Halloween, um, Shout Prince out Dr. of Darkness, Loomis. and Doctor Loomis. Rest in peace, Donald Pleasance. Uh, so, Adrian Barbeau is also in this. She was in The Fog. Tom Atkins, uh, who is also in The Fog, is in this. Lee Van Cleef. Uh, you know, he's, uh, been in quite a few Westerns. Uh, he was in Good, the Bad, the Ugly with, uh, Clint Eastwood. Um, this also has Isaac Hayes in it. So this film is like over the top, fun, crazy, retro futurism. The synopsis is, uh, in 1987 when the U.S. president, played by Donald Pleasance, crashes into Manhattan, now a giant maximum security prison, a convicted bank robber. Kurt Russell, is sent in to rescue him. So, this film, basically Kurt Russell is a former military badass uh, turned, you know, uh, criminal. He robbed a bank or whatever. So, he's offered a pardon if he can rescue the president from Manhattan, which is now basically a prison. Um, it's just been left alone and a big wall has been built around it. And all of the uh, prisoners inside are free to roam, do whatever they want. Um, once you go in, you don't come out, uh, and there's no interference from the outside. Um, so it's crazy. It's an action sci-fi film, I guess, more than it is a horror film. But it, it still got very, uh, you know, dark vibes, and you can tell it's a John Carpenter film again, just because we were talking about the uh, the worlds that he builds. You fully believe that. Uh, this is probably how the world is. Um, and these characters can fully exist uh, to the fullest of their potential in this world. Now, this had a much bigger budget than The Fog and Halloween. This was a $6 million film. And for the time, if you compare this to The Fog or Halloween, you can definitely tell it had a larger budget. Um, but I feel like the biggest thing with this is the retrofuturism. Uh, it's crazy to think that in 1981... This is the idea that they had that 1997 was going to be like. Um, so yeah, uh, 90, before, 97 was nowhere near as cool as this movie, <laughs> right? Um, so definitely check this out if you haven't. I don't want to stay on this and linger too long. I'm eager to get to this main event coming up. Um, but basically, uh, there's a lot of reoccurring uh, casting here that happens a lot with John Carpenter films. But some fun information: uh, this was co-written by Nick Castle. Um, the main character or one of the main characters in the fog is named Nick Castle. Um, but the Nick Castle that co-wrote Escape from New York is the 
actor who portrayed Michael Myers in the original Halloween. Um, except for one scene, the scene where his mask is pulled off that's not Nick Castle. Everything else is. So, cool little Easter eggs there. Um, anything you want to mention? Yeah, guys, I got a couple things to mention on uh, Escape from New York, especially in relation to The Fog. Well, first of all, Escape from New York is one of those awesome 80s action movies that are over the top. It's in line with movies like uh, Big Trouble in Little China. Um, it's, you know, it's more shit like that, Termi- uh, Terminator, John right? John Carpenter. Like, it's just a thrill ride, right? Like Total Recall and stuff like that. Like it's just it's just so Robo-Cop. much fun to watch. And uh it's RoboCop, right? It's movies that as a kid you probably watched them sooner than you should have. But um that was part of the thrill of them, it's just kind of sneaking and watching them. But um a couple of the Easter eggs like you talked about from Carpenter's previous films to this one is the way they use that Ford L T D station wagon in this that they also use in the in the fog, and I'm assuming it's the same one they use in Halloween. We'll have to fact check that, but I know between Escape from New York and the fog, it's the same one. And also, Dean Cundy, the cinematographer for Escape from New York, is the same cinematographer from uh, the fog. So that's pretty awesome, right? But other he than also that, did man, Jurassic Park, which is crazy. Do what? He was also the cinematographer on Jurassic Park, which is yeah. crazy. For Jurassic Park, yeah. So that's uh. That's pretty excellent. So, uh, I mean, other than that, guys, just Escape from New York. You know, that's... If you have not seen it, you must be living under a rock. But I'm sure most of you have. But show it to a friend. Show it to a family member. Um, It has a sequel, too. Technically, in a way. Yeah. Escape from L.A. But check out Escape from New York and then work your way to it. So, uh, what else have you been watching? Yeah, guys, so uh, this next thing um, is not necessarily a film. It's a docuseries that does not suck cocks in hell. It is uh, called Cursed Films. It's on Shudder, and it's from this year, 2020. And uh, essentially, this is about uh, films that have myth, lore, and legend surrounding them, and this docuseries explores those, right? So it talks to the cast and crew, um, the people that the film you know people that the film impacted people, their lives yeah like yes yes people that the film impacted their lives one way or another for the good or for the bad but it's essentially these films that have these uh negative vibes about them that have been considered cursed so the first episode is over The Exorcist. So The Exorcist, if you've ever looked into it that much, it has a whole lot of um, urban legends about it, a whole lot of uh, myths and lore surrounding it, and uh, all the negative things that happened to the cast and crew while the production was ongoing. Um, So for one thing, they had fires on set, um, so they had all these extravagant set pieces, and... A major fire happened, and it burned down all of the set except for uh, the room where they were doing the exorcism scenes. So a lot of people automatically assume since that room was the only room that survived the fire, it is possible that the demon is real and the demon is safeguarding that room. Kind of crazy, but, uh, you know, this was a a different time, I guess. Um, A lot of people were saying that the... (coughs) Lucifer is ingrained in the celluloid of the film because so many bad things were happening. Nine people associated with the film died during making the film. Could you imagine if nine people died on one of our films, Justin? That's a like, lawsuit. That's that's a lawsuit. That's a lot of fucking people. Like, if you think about it. Um, Linda Blair supposedly received so many death threats because she was playing the character she played. Um, that the studio had to hire bodyguards for her. So people were literally making death threats to her because they thought that she was actually possessed or like uh, devil incarnate. Um, pretty fucking insane, right? So uh, there's a scene in the movie um, where they have like a radiological tech, um, like a radiographer performing um, some surgical scenes. So William Friedkin, um, he went to research... Uh, some real life radiographers for this scene 
and he found this guy named Paul Bateson, and this is a, an actor that he picked out for this scene. This guy was a real-life uh, radiologist. He, uh, he put him in the film, and the guy actually acted in the film. And um, in 1979, this guy ended up murdering Addison Verrill, which was a film industry journalist, and uh, he ended up doing time in prison. But he, while he was in prison, he boasted that he was actually a serial killer that killed a whole lot of people in Manhattan or across New York State. Um, but he got out of prison, I think, in 2005, and they never could follow up on charges for his supposedly uh, serial killings or his mass slayings. Um, but people have been looking for him since uh, to follow up and do interviews with him and all that. Some people say he's alive. Some people say he's died. Um, they don't really know, but he's out there, possibly somewhere roaming the streets. So, uh, yeah, The Exorcist has a whole lot of weird shit going on with it. Um, if you're somebody that likes behind-the-scenes documentaries of films or, you know, anything of that nature, definitely give Cursed Films a look. Um, like I said, it's a five-part docuseries over different films. Um, I'm hooked from the first episode in, so I'm definitely going to be checking out the other ones. Yeah, I'm probably going to binge that, um. That, that seems like a cool thing to do this weekend. So, are you ready to dive into the main event? I feel like we need a boxing bell right here. Right? Ding, ding, ding. I might uh, just do that, maybe. So, do um, you want to introduce this, or do you want me to roll this off? Uh, I got you here. So, from the very first uh, time that I saw the cover art for this film, and then once I saw the title card, Justin... I knew that this film was going to be something that I was totally going to be into. And this is a film from last year, 2019, called Satanic Panic. You can mm -hmm. take it from there. You can take it from there. But, uh, yeah, this is Satanic I, I Panic. I fully agree. As soon as, like, you know, I started to watch the trailer, and then I stopped because I was automatically just, I loved the style and the vibe I was getting from, like, the first 10 seconds. So I was like, no, I'm just going to go watch the film. So I, I stopped watching the trailer. So, uh... Like you said, this came out in 2019, but we finally just now got to watch it. Um, so it's directed by Chelsea Stardust. It stars Rebecca Romain, Arden Mirren, Haley Griffith, Ruby Modine. Or Modine. I don't want to. I don't know how to pronounce that, so I'll just throw both out there. Uh, you know, correct me if you guys know. And uh, surprisingly enough, Jerry O'Connell, um, Kangaroo Jack. Yep. So uh, this film is all around fun. It is a straight up blast. Um, the synopsis is a pizza delivery girl at the end of her financial rope has to fight for her life and her tips when her last order of the night turns out to be high society Satanist in need of a virgin sacrifice. If that alone does not make you say, that's it, I want to watch this fucking film, well, I don't know, like, you're probably one of those people that just doesn't like anything because this is a, a very fun film, um... It as soon as the film starts off, you know it's just one crazy wacky thing after another. Um, there's a lot of cool uh, kills in this film. We don't want to spoil it and give too much away. Um, uh, you want to mention some stuff about this? Because uh, yeah, so so straight away, guys. He said uh, she fights for her life and her tips, not her tits, by the way, because uh, it sounded all like you said she fights for her life and for her tits. No, definitely but, uh, tips. Definitely tips. But um, yeah, so like he said, this movie is just uh, it's just it's just great all around. It's in the vein of movies like Deathgasm and The Babysitter. Um, it's just uh, it's just loads of fun. It's something that it's not a cerebral horror. You don't have to sit down and really uh, dissect it. You don't have to um, put the pieces together in your head. I mean, on the second viewing of it, I noticed a lot of little Easter eggs throughout or a lot of little um, hints of what was to come. Not so much Easter eggs, a lot of hints of what was to come throughout the film to give me a better idea of what was going to happen at the end. But um, on my initial viewing, like, I was just so enamored with uh, with just how wacky it was and just, just how fun it was. Like, I skate on a very thin line when it becomes... When, when I have, like, a horror comedy, like, I think stuff is either, like, great when it's super campy, like Evil Dead, or, like, uh, Dead Alive, like, old B-movies like that, um, 
but I don't get into stuff like scary movie, right? To where it's just like it's it's more comedy than it is horror. I think it has to have a good balance for me to actually enjoy it. And uh, to me, this was just uh, the perfect balance of that. Right. Well, to me, this is one of those films. It's a uh, it, it's marketed as a horror comedy, but to me, it's not really a comedy. It's kind of uh, it's more of a comic book horror, like. You know, it, that's how I like to describe them. Like, if you haven't seen The Babysitter or Deathgasm, the easiest comparison uh, to the writing style and the vibe of film uh, is something like Happy Death Day, right? Um, uh, that's the most commercial horror film I can think of that kind of has that vibe, if you haven't seen the others we mentioned. Um, but, you know, it's horror. There's there's suspense. There's death. There's blood and stuff like that. But it, it's got more Somebody's of Somebody's killed with a strap on. Yeah, this uh, the drildo as we're calling it. Um, we're not going to give that away. You got to watch it to see it. But it is just nuts. But yeah, it's one of those films. It's like uh, there's just a lot of cheekiness and um, you're you're just rooting for the crazy shit to happen. It's not one of those films where you're scared or you're thinking, oh, this could happen to me. Like it, this isn't the kind of film that's going to make you not want to sleep, you know, in the dark, right? Um, but it is a, a fun film, but. So we're I don't running know. in. I don't know. About... Jerry O'Connell coming after you in his whitey tidies. Is, uh, that, is that's of, pretty uh... scary. Uh, so we're running. We got about four minutes left. Uh, so I want to jump a little bit from the story because if we talk too much more about it, we're going to give a lot away. So I want to jump into uh, the cast and crew a little bit. Uh, so um, Haley Griffith is the leading uh, uh, character. She plays the leading character in this. Um, she's not been in too much, uh, but I feel like she carries her own weight. You know, she's up against, uh, she's in scenes with Rebecca Romaine, Arden Marin, and then her scene with Jerry O'Connell, it's literally just the two of them. And, you know, she, she makes you fully believe that she is that character. Um, she and holds her I, own. she, she does hold her own. But what really impresses me about this film is, that, so Chelsea Stardust, the director, this is her debut uh, this is her directorial debut as far as a feature film. She's done some short films, but uh, she started as an assistant for Blumhouse, uh, for Jason Blum himself. Uh, she's you know been an assistant on some of the Insidious films, Sinister films, uh, The Purge, Paranormal Activity. So she's definitely paid her dues and climbed the ladder. Um, and I'm definitely going to be looking forward to some more of her work. You know, as I, I was telling you a little earlier before we started uh, getting this thing rolling. Um, I haven't been this impressed with a directorial debut since, uh, Robert Edgar's in the witch and, uh, Jordan Peele would get out. Not that this film is in the same, like n the three of these films are nothing like each other, except for the fact that those directors, that was, uh, their debut. So definitely going to be looking out for more of her work. So we've got about a minute left. Uh, you want to say anything else about this film before, uh, I see us out? Yeah, no, essentially, uh, you basically covered it, guys. This was just a, a thrill ride from from the start to finish, and um, it's definitely a must-see. I would put it in your, your top three of things to watch in the next week. Um, but yeah, so uh, like you said, Chelsea Stardust, she killed it on this, knocked it out of the park, and anything that her name's on in the future, I'll, I'm definitely fully bought in. And uh, this is a movie that you expect to see somebody's... Um, you know, their sophomore or junior year of their their uh, filmmaking career, not just coming straight out of the gate with something heavy like this, something that is just, um, you know, I don't want to say it's flawless, but I want to say that it is, I don't see any chinks in the armor of this film, you know, like you mentioned with, with The Witch and uh, like Get Out, as well as like Ari Aster's uh, Hereditary, right? You know, some of these people, they've had plenty of, directing uh experience or whatever with short films and all that but once they hit their their feature it's like they hit the ground running hard um yep. satanic panic you know it's uh it's as rad as the name sounds um i gave it a a, a nine out of ten for sure Te check it yep. out Yep, definitely same here. So uh, that's going to wrap it up for this episode, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, you know, give us a review on whatever you're listening on. Uh, check us out at Black Mass Films on Instagram and Twitter. Look us up on Facebook and YouTube. And we will catch you guys next week. Yeah, see you later.